Hi everyone and welcome to the second session of day three of Arab Oil and Gas Academy internship program. My name is Nihal Munir and I'll be your moderator for the day. We have a great lecture lined up for you today. As always, we want to answer all your questions in an effective manner. So for this reason, please interact with us and leave your question only on the Q&A tab as well as YouTube Live. I would only be looking at these two. Also, please keep your questions relevant to the technical content of the lecture only. So it's easier for me to filter. Any other questions or inquiries, please address them on the Facebook group. Side note, please keep the chat area professional. Any irrelevant comments will be well received. And now let me introduce our speaker. Our speaker for the day is Dr. Mehdi Azari. Dr. Mehdi Azari was a senior global technical advisor, retired from Halliburton after 32 years of service. He has more than 40 years of experience in the oil and gas industry and has authored more than 100 publications with 15 U.S. patents, uh, U.S. and international patents. He was previously a professor of petroleum engineering at University of Wyoming and worked at OSCO Computer Center in Abdan, Iran, and is a member of SP and Paula. His area of expertise um, is reservoir characterization of fluids, as well as testing, production operation and optimization, gas lift evaluation, asphaltine remediation, pipeline and truck setting, um, secondary recovery studies such as water, gas, and polymer flooding, as well as combined WAG, completion and uh, stimulation optimization. Um, Dr. Mehdi was uh, a consultant for Halliburton, Algeria, um, Saudi Aramco, and, K uh, and KOC with a total experience of uh, consultancy um, to, six, to up to um, 6.5 years. So I uh, would really advise you to focus and concentrate on this um, amazing lecture. Dr. Mehdi, thank you so much for being with us today and over to you. Thank you, Liz uh, Nahal, uh, very much. I also want to thank uh, our sponsor, Dr. Ahmed al Qarhi, for arranging this one because I know this thing takes a lot of time to, to prepare. I know it looks like I'm doing everything. No, but uh, behind the scenes, there are people that are uh, helping and doing this thing. It takes a lot of time to do that. And um, um, also, good afternoon and uh, good evening to uh, people, different parts of the world that are joining here. Uh, my pleasure to make this presentation to you. This is a one week to two week uh, course that I have uh, summarized it into one hour. I mean, Dr. Ahmed told me that I can go over because it's the last presentation. So I do not have any problem to stay here two, three, four, five, six hours. <laughs> I'm just joking. Uh, probably go about the one and a half hour, two hours max. And uh, um, because I know that some vacation is gonna be late for you guys. And as Ms. Nahal um, uh, introduced me, this is my uh, information and my uh, basically short bio here. And I, I have also included my, uh, my telephone here. Uh, if I do not look at the, mark, uh, the, the camera, because uh, I have two monitors, so uh, the, the presentation is on my big monitor here uh, for ease of use. And one other question, why are you guys still in petroleum engineer? I mean, after all you see here. <laughs> I, I wish you guys luck, you know, and have a good future. And, uh, Reservoir management is managed in the reservoir and to produce the maximum reserves in an economically viable manner. I mean, you know that these days we, a lot of companies they could not produce it economically because the price of oil was down, the cost was high, so they had to lay off people, they had to shut down some wells, especially in these unconventional wells in, in US. And how do we do that? I mean, we do some pressure transient testing, some uh, portable, uh, uh, GOR at the wellhead, and then uh, which is like a small separator we put at the wellhead uh, every few months. And um, different locations have different plans. In Algeria, they do it every six months to a year to know what's the, the life of that well, how is that well doing. 
And then from that data, from the oil production, gas production, uh, GOR, the, the, the well head pressure, they do a lot of decisions. Once you, pl you put in these into a program, you know, the history of this well uh, over the life of that well, and not only that, but all the offset wells are on that, and then you plot it on a, which I'm gonna get to those later on, then you can get a lot of idea which parts of the reservoir has been depleted most, which parts have not been depleted more. So that would be a good decision to find out why that area has not been depleted. Then that, that could be a possibility that you could drill in that area. And there are some directional uh, uh, pro, uh, profile in the reservoir. Some directions, like a, a lot of time, like east, west, uh, northeast, and the different directions. But when you create a fracture, intentionally or unintentionally, the fracture is going to grow most of the places in the world that I've seen in the northeast, southwest direction. In Nigeria, they were doing water flooding, and then the water flooding between well A and well B is going to be fast. But that could be a big distance. But the, the well C, which is to the right of it, would not see the increase in water, uh, water production. That shows the directional pattern that exists in the reservoir. So pressure transient testing is one technique. Decline curve analysis, how the well is declining is another one. Material balance is how much you produce and uh, what is the remaining uh, hydrocarbon place. And you also do reservoir simulation. I'm gonna cover some of these cases now. When you do well testing, you, well testing is something that you do throughout the, the life of a reservoir. And there are some formation testers that to make development and completion decision, make like DST and the wild formation tester that will give you whether you should continue and complete that formation, you're not. And then production testing is you, you find out uh, what is the, how much you have uh, produced on this one, what is the remaining lab, how much your uh, uh, pressure has declined, stuff like that, based on the amount of oil that you have produced. And then the, there's some formation evaluation uh, testing that you evaluate the reservoir before and after it, that you do any job. Like uh, a lot of these Gulf of Mexico, they're producing at very high rate, they're very low um, uh, uh, cons uh, consolidation, so when they produce, they create a lot of damage. So, and then they have a lot of layers. So it's not only one layer. So now they need to find out which layer is causing the problem if they have a skin. And we have had cases that the skin was very excessively high. We do production logging uh, to find out uh, uh, the, the property of those and uh, how much the skin it has. And a lot of time we just tell them right away that you have a skin and go and acidize it. While they're still at there, because this is offshore, while they're still over there. And then, so let's say you want to do a hydraulic fracturing. Before you do hydraulic fracturing, you need to find out, you do test to find out what is the reservoir pressure. If you have enough pressure in that reservoir, if you have a skin damage, what is the permeability? Because all of these affect. If the pressure, reservoir pressure is low, uh, then you do not do hydraulic fracturing. I think there's a rule of thumb that in Algeria, uh, when the pressure goes below 180, 70 kilogram per centimeter square, they say it's not worth it. They, they don't do hydraulic fracture because you need to have pressure to, I'm going to spend money in here. I need to have enough pressure for the oil to surge out. And sometimes the low product is because of a skin and permanent is high. So if you do hydraulic fracturing quickly, you're going to bypass that, that the skin damage. And then after that, uh, permit is high. If permit is high, you're not going to create fracture. So you basically, you spend a lot of money doing hydraulic fraction. You only bypass the skin. You can do at the fraction of the cost by acidizing. So it's very important to do for uh, well testing to find out if this is worth it to do well testing and then do, do a design. And then after you're done with hydraulic fracturing or even acidizing, you do another test and see if the, the operation that you did was successful. And then uh, I, I explained that you find out um, the, if the reservoirs have been depleted basically from the pressure build up, draw down, injection for all these things that you can do. So what do we do? What do we find from a well testing? A deliverability, like a KH, we call it that one. Initial reservoir pressure, PI, reservoir boundary. These are some of the things that you can find it with the reservoir limit test. And then uh, see if there's any boundary nearby. They, they might have caused the, the low, uh, basically production. And then you want, you want to know the KZKR, how good the, the, the formation communicates vertically. 
I'm going to show you one case that the, in um, Brazil that they did not uh, perforate the entire zone. And then uh, I'll show you that, that it showed uh, low production. They had to go there and do a massive acidizing uh, ball heading, which is you in, inject acid at a high pressure to, to, to fracture it, basically. And then you need to get the fluid samples. This is a part of the well testing. And for PVT analysis, you know what kind of fluid you have. And then for the well bore, you can get the skin damage, well bore storage, how big is storage. If your tubulars have some leaks, so that that is going to give you a very high, uh, basically, uh, volume. So you find out. Phase degradation is another one. If uh, you have some liquid and uh, light liquid or gas that are on the bottom of the lava, and then they're going to, after they build up on the bottom, they're going to go up and then the pressure changes. So those are well segregation. And then if you have hydraulic fracture, how long is that fracture? How effective that fracture? So all of these things we can find out from that one. And then uh, you, you do a uh, result management part of this. You do periodically, you do the bottom hole survey to find out the average of pressure to help you on the decline. And then once you plot these pressures over time, you can see there's a decline of pressure. So you know it's declining. <clears throat> there are some parts in Algeria because they do not have good communication in the same field, in the same adjacent well. So there's one well that has produced for 40, 50 years. This is the decline. And then you suddenly, after, after the bottom of this decline, then you start drilling another well. It just starts at this one. So you know that this is going to eventually go there. So now if it, if it declines differently, you know that this guy, this well was in a separate uh, production uh, area. So you know that they are not uh, related. So we find some of those. And then if, it, if this guy quickly uh, uh, pressure drops and goes to the same decline, you know that they are connected. It is in the same reservoir. And then, so production history is very important. You find the candidates for workover from this well testing or simulation. You find that the tubing leaks from the well bore storage, leaky gas, leak valves, all of these things can be found. The interval communication, if you have two wells, you want to know if these two are connected together. There are, there are different tests that we can do, like a, a pulse test and interference test. And then once you find the, the, the decline, then you can set allocation. The same thing ha can, can happen when you're doing water injection, gas injection. Sometimes you're injecting at very high rate, and some, some places have not been totally covered. Though in those cases, you need to increase production. So all of these are part of the allocation. So now we have different types of tests. The, the, there are some short tests on the, if you look at here, on the x-axis is time. So to the left is the short test and how much knowledge you can get. There are some sequential formation testing and like RDT, which is a Halliburton tool for volume formation tester that you can go there. And then we are talking about tests like a minutes to sometimes I have done some papers with, uh, with Chevron that we were able to analyze it after like a half a minute of a buildup, half a minute of buildup. And, but, but typically we're talking about the few minutes, five, 10 minutes of buildup to, to establish uh, the reservoir properties. So those are formation, the wire long formation tests. Then there's one that we have, we, at Halliburton we call it uh, FASTES. It's a set of equipment that we, I'm gonna talk about it, that uh, we built and uh, this is for uh, environmentally friendly that you do not uh, uh, flare the oil or gas at surface and you have a chamber you you flow it into that chamber and then you can get the, the properties like a closed chamber or surge test type of it and then the, the liquid you can inject it back into another reservoir which is not not the main reservoir and uh, we had the wireless uh, telemetry that we bring the data to surface in real time this is a dsd this is not wireless information. So there's no wire in the way, but everything is done uh, by uh, acoustically. And then we have the DSC and production tests, which are longer, takes a lot of money and set up uh, on new wells. But there's another set of wells, which are like extended well testing and the early production testing, and then the things like that one, that you bring a lot of separators, you bring a, a lot of uh, tools uh, to the wellhead to do that one. And when, when I was in Saudi Arabia, you know, producing these unconventional wells, it is very typical to produce a well uh, gas and gas condensate. I mean, it has a very, very high API gravity liquid that comes out. I mean, the, the liquid is just like water. I mean, it's a jet fuel. 
but we are burning them for about a month, month and a half before we can totally clean that, that fracture because it's a tight formation. So for those, you need a lot of uh, well testing equipment to do the separators and stuff like that. And then to do that. The, the, some of these techniques, uh, I mean, the Saudi Arabia because it was unconventional, but there are some of these conventional wells, high primitive wells, that you still do a long-term test, you extend the testing. Why? Because you want to see the side of the reservoir. Because as you're producing this the pressure transients keep going into the reservoir, reservoir, until they hit the boundary. In U.S., they, it is very important for them because they, they, they come, some of the smaller companies, they do not have a lot of uh, resources. So they, they come up with a well and produce is good. Now they want to know how big is the reservoir. How big is it? I have been to so many of these uh, uh, presentations with the investor. So now they are telling that so the size of the reservoir is such and such. So I need to, to verify, yes, it is the case. I need to make presentations. So those are very long tests until you set the bond. So these are like seconds to minutes. These are hours to uh, basically months, some of them. Uh, I eliminate a whole bunch of these, but there are so many different types of tests and drill stem testing, slug testing, and closed chamber DST searches, shoot and pull tests. So you just go over the passes, interference and pulses. Drawdown and build up, injection fall off, mini frag, defeat, bottom of pressure gradient surveys, hazardous, hazardous waste uh, disposal wells, which is, I did a, one of those cases just like a, in February, I finished it in January, February. Flow after flow test, multi layer test, uh, MRMZ, step rate, four point test, isocorona for, for gas, production test, early production system, and reservoir limit. So you can see there's so many, I mean, you might not have already, some of you might have already heard. DSC, but there's a whole bunch of those. There's different purpose for each one of them and different setup to, to do the test. A lot of them, what you're trying to find out is the productive capacity, if it has oil or hydrocarbon in that zone, what is the pressure, what is permeability, if there's any damage. These are the goals. Some of them, the longer ones, you want to see the bonds, all right? So now uh, we talk about the DST. It was uh, introduced to the industry in 1926. It's a temporary arrangement with a bunch of tools and tubulars and packers who isolate one zone and produce it. So it's a basically a temporary completion. And then uh, the, the DSTs are done, pass in the wildcat wells, offset wells, and in field wells. So basically a, a lot of applications. And uh, so you, you can look at the data and then based on that data that you get that one, you make the decision whether I should complete this well, if it has enough resources, hydrocarbons to complete it or not. So a lot of the decision is based on some of these uh, early time tests. And then, the, as I said, permeability skin, those are the main things in pressure. If you have any uh, basic boundaries and also oh, another, uh, another one is fluid type. So they take a lot of the, a lot of the fluid comes up to the surface and then they, they take it for the, for the lab. And some of the, the, the PVT is like a, a PVT type of uh, hydrocarbon that they collect, which is at initial reservoir pressure and temperature. And some of them are just a bulk, big volume that you do it for uh, other uh, applications. This is a very simple cartoon of that one. When you're flowing in a DSD, it is flowing. So it flows all the way. It could flow all the way to surface because you set your packer here. You set your packer, you have a bunch of valves and gauges, stuff like that to, to monitor what's going on. And then when you want to do a, a build up, you just shut it in. One advantage is you're shutting it at downhole. So now once it is downhole, you are limiting the, the volume of the fluid that can come into the, uh, into the chamber, which is down here. It is, so you're going to start building up fast. If you shut it in at surface, it's going to take a long time. So it is a basically drilling stick and you have packers and then you perforate a pipe or sometimes uh, uh, what we call is TCP, tubing combined perforator which has perforation uh, guns at the bottom, you perforate, you produce at the same time, okay? So different arrangements can be done. And you have a bunch of ta uh, valves and pressure gauge. And what you do normally in a DSC, we have two types of flow and build up. And uh, two, two sequence of that one. 
Why? Because uh, if I look at the, the first two, and hopefully the second build-up is going to build up to the same pressure as previous one. I've had seen cases that the second build-up or this, even the third build-up pressure keeps going lower and lower. That means that formation is a very small formation. It's not worth it to complete it. I'm going to show you some cases of those. And so the first flow should be long enough that you build up the excess pressure in case it is a uh, supercharge, we see supercharge uh, here and there. And uh, because when you're drilling, uh, when you, they drill, they, they drill at a higher pressure than formation. So the, the mud invades in the formation. If the formation is oil, has a better possibility that it gets supercharged because gas is uh, moves faster, easier uh, into the formation. Uh, and then tight formations keep the supercharge. So these are two, two cases uh, that are supercharged, like uh, oil and tight formation. And now this is one example, and I believe this is from Algeria and uh, that I was involved in that. So this is typical DST on the bottom here. And this is uh, done with sapphire software. I'm gonna show you some cases with sapphire. We are gonna run something together a design case. So this is the floor is zero here. This is floor area. You can see the jumps to high, like a 20, 40, something, 40 MQ per hour. And uh, zero again, 40 MQ per hour. And then to like a low value, like a five, and then goes to zero and so on. So rate is changing, but let's find out what is going on. So this is the, at surface, you go down. As you go down, you have a gauge. The gauge reads uh, higher and higher pressure as you go down there. You set the packer here, and then some pressure gets released here. And then at this point, you open it up. You, once you open it up, pressure drops, and then drops sharply to roughly about 140. And then you shut it in, very short. I mean, this is like a very short period. You, so that's your first buildup. It is about one hour. So one hour here, uh, I mean, one hour of build up here. So one hour of build up, pressure builds up to 381. This is the unit that they use over this kilogram per centimeter square. And then, then you open it again. So you open it up again and then goes up again. So there's some fluctuation because you opened it maybe too high and then you reduce the choke size, stuff like that. Or you open that. And now you do a build up. So the second build up, as you can see in this table here, is 15 hours. So 15 hours of build up here, which is here, builds up to about 354.6. So now pressure has declined. And then you open it again here, this is the drawdown, you stabilize it, and then you do a build up. This, this one is 18 hours, which is longer than the second one. And it builds up to 336. So you can see sequentially in three build up, you're making the duration longer, but the pressure goes lower. This was a trouble case because they had done, uh, they did hydraulic fracturing. They did hydraulic fracturing, the, the fracture produced a little, they were produced a little bit, a few days, and then uh, they lost productivity. And so they spent a lot of money. They did acidizing, they did a lot of work. They did a lot of work on this one, one after each other. So they spent a lot of money on that one, nothing. So it came to me. Uh, the first thing I did, I, I got the data and plotted these things. I just told them, this tells you that, that there's, uh, there's not a whole lot of things. Uh, from the geology, it looks like it's, it's a big... This was on one of the out, outer skirts of Hasim Masood in the northeast area. And the uh, geology showed that it should be open, it should be connected. But then from the analysis, I found that there is a boundary. There has to be a boundary. And, and, and I actually calculated the distance to the boundary. Years later, uh, when I came back to US, uh, after I went to Saudi and Kuwait and came back to US, part of uh, World Information Testing again, I wrote a paper on that one with some of our Algerian friends. And uh, I think I included that in that paper, presenting the formation that makes it important. So what are these other factors is, uh, the, some places they say that you need to have at least 30 minutes of initial opening. Basically you want to clean up, get the sur uh, supercharge gone, and uh, then after that, you need to shut it in roughly about twice the length of the first uh, uh, production. So if you did 30 minutes of uh, production, you do it one hour of build up. This is the first one. And then the second one is um, you, you draw it a little bit more. 
uh, to to see uh, the, and and then you do a longer build up because you, you want to see that the result information. So the next test is a uh, DSC. So we cover DSC. So a slug test. What is a slug test? The production part of a of a DSC is called a slug test. And in a slug test, uh, typical slug test, pressure does not build up to the high enough to go to surface. There is a special technique to to go, to do that one. And uh, so this is a drawing from a slug test. So this part is the slug part. But you could call you could call the same thing as a basically DSC. So the whole thing could be a DSC, but this part is a slug. So there's a special technique to to analyze this slug. Uh, if you know the size of the tubular, you know the volume. You, from from the pressure rise, you know the volume because now I have the air, uh, cross sectional area, and pressure gives you height. So pressure gives you height. So I uh, this pressure, this delta P, which is from here to here it gives me the delta p so the, how much pressure build up during this period of time which is which is here this is the period of time here from here to here you see my mouse and so i i know the time i know how much it build up i then i can find out the h what is the Poisson thickness once i get that one i can multiply by cross section area that gives me area i can divide it by time that gives me floor so these are some of the techniques we have other other software, so uh, uh, special software that uh, one of them is the one that I developed myself. I call it DFAST. DFAST is the design of fastest. Fastest is a testing technique developed by Dr. Sullivan, and we were co workers uh, at, at that time. And uh, I developed the DFAST. The DFAST is, designs every liquid that comes to the well bore, gas, oil, and mud, and then uh, until bits. So it, it, you could be call it uh, for the slug test, or you could call it for the search test, or any kind of this is, it, it can be done. I mean, it's a very versatile program. So now the closed chamber DSC is a closed chamber. It, the chamber is closed, and then you, you have gauges on the top, you have gauges on the bottom, and by monitoring these, you should be able to, to understand what is going on. And uh, Let me see if I, yeah, this is a closed chamber diagram here. So when you're doing closed chamber, uh, the, the well head is closed. You can see that here, the well head here is closed. And then the bottom is open, the, the, the valve is open. Once you produce it, normally you perforate. And then right at that time, you have a closed chamber here. And uh, so you, it builds up. But once it builds up, the, then on the right-hand side, you close the valve. And then once you close the valve, you can open the, the top. A lot of time, the closed chamber is a good idea, but when you are a wildcat, you do not know what is going on. You can start with the with the well with the closed chamber. You close it. You have control here. The valve at the surface closed, and then once you see that the, you can manage it, it doesn't have excessive pressure. Then you can convert it to the normal DSC, which is open and flow and stuff like that. Two cycles of flow and buildup. So now, uh, the, the closed chamber that we said is, uh, is a closed chamber. Huh? Uh, the way it was done originally was the, the entire well bore is closed. Now we came with a, a special uh, a part of that is uh, basically, which we call it the surges. The surges is you, you limit the volume. The volume could be like a one barrel, half a barrel, uh, uh, based on Muhammad Solomon's uh, equations, I developed some technique that I can design it, design the, the chamber size. Let's say that the idea is to, to build, to do a build up in one hour. So based on one hour, I can make the chamber size smaller. If the floor if the permit is high, I can make the chamber size a little bit bigger because I want to do it in one hour. If, if the chamber is small, based on a permit of one million dollars, but the permit is 1,000 meters, so, so that, that chamber is going to fill up in, in two minutes, one minute. So I do not have enough data. So I need to make it a little bit uh, bigger for that. So that's part of the design technique. And then that technique, as I told the Dr. Selma, it's called fastest. Now, the search testing is uh, very similar. Is you, you have a chamber, and then you close that chamber. The chamber is closed, and then you, you fill it up. Fill it up with that one. And then 
doing that one, you're recording the pressure. So you could have a pressure here. It is also a good idea to have a pressure on top of the chamber. And uh, then based on these pressures, uh, I only need one pressure, but uh, it's good to have extra pressure in case you have multiple fluids flowing. And uh, we have an analysis technique which is very robust and then gives you permeability and pressure very, very uh, precisely. So now you look at this one, it's very similar to that slot test, but the slot test was slowly building up. But now when you're talking about searches, because this chamber is designed to give you properties within, let's say, a certain period of time, you can see that here. Once you open it up, pressure drops so fast and then builds up so fast. You know? It drops fast because you open it into a vacuum, into an uh, air, a uh, surface condition. Huh? And then, but suddenly it fills up. So now the way it fills up, uh, it, we can analyze it very well. So this looks like a very good case. So now you have an underbalanced pressure, which, is, which could be high. So a lot of these are designed for um, uh, offshore Gulf of Mexico uh, because they, they get a lot of damage because they have high permeability. They, have, uh, they get a lot of damage and then they need to clean it up. So now you need to surge it, which is this case. You can see there's a big pressure drop. That big pressure drop is going to clean all the mud, all the debris uh, from the, from the, around the world, book, which is very good. But now if you have an uh, unconsolidated formation, which is a lot of those wells in that area, too much pressure drop is going to produce the, the sand into the world war and mess up the world war. Okay, so now you should not do that. So there's another technique is uh, that originally came by George King. Uh, uh, he came up with that one and then he, uh, on the y-axis is formation permeability, on the x-axis pressure, how much pressure uh, on the balance. So let's say formation permeability is 10 milli RC. You can go to this one is, you come up with an underbalance of 1266, that's minimum under balance, okay? What is the maximum under balance? The entire reservoir pressure. If the reservoir pressure is 4,329, that's your maximum. So the way George King did, he did a lot of these studies that they did under balance, let's say 100 under balance, and another well in the same formation, they did 200 under balance, 300, 500, something like that. And then all of those, he put it here. He had the permitted and the under balance. And then the ones that the underbalance was effective to clean the formation and didn't need acidizing, he drew a line and then he was able to, because there's a lot of wells, a lot of wells, he was able to draw a line. So that line it gives us some basis for this kind of activity. So in this situation, parameter was 10 meters, minimum is 1266 that we found out here. Now, what is a surges? Surges is also the same as uh, the fastest, uh, the slot, not the slot, the fastest and the closed chamber, stuff like that. The different names for that is surge into formation. This is an example from Egypt. Uh, typically in Egypt, they like to do 100, 200 PSI underbalance on a whale and to see how pressure builds up. So they have the blue line here, you see here, is before they do a frac uh, job here, it is building slowly. Then they did a frac pack job, Halliburton did the frac pack job, and then you see it is building up very fast. Both of them 200 PSI uh, on the balance. The first one, it, it provided like 92 PSI build up in two hours, this one. In two hours, 92 PSI, 900 uh, build up. But on the red one here, 220 PSI increase in one hour. So that's a lot better. So that's, that's a measure of... Uh, uh, how good that on the balance of surge happened. So basically you're doing a surge. Now fastest is the, 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 the testing technique uh, that uh, I mentioned about that for no flaring, uh, you can get it. And then one of the design of that one is the chamber, size of the chamber that you need to design it. And then you have the, the lower, we have a lower surge chamber here. You have an upper main surge chamber here. Because now I can surge it into this one, this, this one, collects all the debris, mud, and stuff like that, with the first time they just surge. Then we start surging into this chamber. Both chambers are designed at a certain pressure, which is everything designed. We, we keep the pressure uh, in, uh, with nitrogen. And uh, so, so now it fills up this chamber. And from the way it builds up, because we have a pressure gauge, I can find out the reservoir properties from here. And then the data was being transmitted to the surface by ATS. We also had some uh, PVT samplers uh, along with it. So we take the fluid sample. So this, it was a very 
uh, sophisticated uh, equipment that we built uh, years back uh, in response to the Shell, BP, uh, Chevron, all of these were involved in the no flurry. Now the interference and pulsing. Interference and pulsing is, uh, uh, I have two wheels, as I mentioned. Sometimes you know, the, the two wheels next to each other, they're not communicating that well, but the, the wheel which is farther away is communicating. Because the reservoir is not homogeneous the way we think. It's not, it's not the same. It's, it keeps changing, the property keeps changing. So this is well A, the blue ones are water injection wells. Well A, you are injecting here, and then well C, you can see that they are in communication. Because if you look at, if you put a gauge here, stop injecting here, pressure is going to rise in C but not in B. So now in order to do that, there are some techniques that you can do a uh, interference testing between A and B and C. So what you do, you put a gauge in B, bottom hole gauge. You put a bottom hole in C and one in this well here. And then you start producing from this well or injecting this well. And then you can see how it is influencing it. So that will help you in a water, water, water injection, or water type of injection, uh, secondary recovery, because if I didn't know that this fault exists, maybe I wouldn't have uh, one of these two. I said, okay, one is enough. Huh? But now you can see I need one on this side and one on that side. And then there's pulse testing. Pulse testing is very similar to interference testing, but you pulse it. You, for instance, you, in this well, you inject it at, uh, let's say, 100 barrel per day or produce it at 100 barrel per day for half an hour. Half an hour later, you shut the well in. And then you start producing uh, another half an hour, 100 barrel per day. So you do it like a cycle. So these are pulses. You pulse and stop. You pulse and stop. And then you, you look at the, the offset goal, which is C and B and this one, to see if the same pulses are repeated in, on the other one. But the pulses in these uh, wells are going to be very low amplitude. It's going to be a very small rise. Whereas in, in the main one, is going to rise a lot. And, but on these, so you need to have good gauges to, to see these pulses. So now, uh, what are the uh, different types of drawdown and buildup? Uh, here is um, in gas wells, for instance, we like to have the four different flows and build up to, to create the, the, what we call deliverability and the turbulence. Because now you plot all of those in a sequence and see if it is actually uh, going in the, the way you, you, they were supposed to go. And and as I said, you shut the well in one and a half times to two times uh, longer than the drawdown power. And then I mentioned earlier reservoir limit test. For the reservoir limit test, you keep producing it uh, and then monitoring it. You have to go there every day, check the, the pressure, stuff like that. I mean, you have a gauge that is recording it, but Sometimes uh, the, the rate flow rate goes lower. You, you need to make sure that the flow rate during the entire test time is the same. So I have done a few of these cases and I've told the customer that you need to go there every day, change the choke size to make sure you get the same fixed flow rate out of that. And uh, one of the ones is, uh, I got very good data. I mean, it's like perfect, like a design case. Until you get to the pseudo studies. Once the boundaries come here, you're going to get to pseudo studies. Pseudo studies is a time that the pressure is depleting continuously. Go through pseudo studies. All right? We, we get to those. So the reservoir limit test, extended test, these are, these are uh, long tests, basically. Now, there's another test called injection follow. The same way that I can produce from a well and shut it in, I can inject into it and uh, shut it in. So it's called injection fault. Exactly the same in terms of analysis is the same. One of them, the production is fluoride is positive. The other one, fluoride is negative. Just put the negative. If I want to produce at 100 barrel per day, for the Q, I put 100. If I want to inject at 100 barrel a day, I put minus 100. That's the difference in terms of analysis. The equations are the same. You can get the same type of information like permeability, uh, permeability skin and reservoir pressure boundaries and why do i do injection follow tests um, let's say i have done a case uh, that uh, years years back 
that helped to fracture the well, uh, unconventional well in uh, Fort Worth area uh, on one of those shales. And then after fracturing, the, the well did not produce. So the the guy came to me, and uh, which was uh, or one of the young BD guy, business development guy. He's right now senior vice president. And uh, so he, I was helping him a lot. And he came to me and said, maybe how can we find it? I said, okay, this well does not produce. I cannot do a test of this one. The only way that we need to, to test it is inject. Inject what? It inject nitrogen. So, so I said, inject nitrogen for, for a day and then let it build up. And nitrogen is expensive, so, but anyhow, I convinced them that you have to inject nitrogen. So we injected nitrogen because this nitrogen is going to push any damage because when you do hydraulic fracture in a, in a tight formation, there's a lot of liquid blockage around the well bore. So you are blocking, you're choking in the, the well bore because the well bore is like this one, huh? small well bore. And if I put damage around here, the oil or gas, which are far, far further away, they cannot pass this one. That's for sure. So this nitrogen that you inject is going to push this one away. Number one, Number two, nitrogen uh, is a gas, can dissolve some liquid into it. So it dissolves some of that with it when you produce it and then moves it away. And then nitrogen is not a damaging fluid. Yeah. If you inject liquid, it's damaging. So anyhow, all of those reasoning, it worked. And we, I was able to, to analyze it and found out that we had a very short fracture. We went and refracted. They were produced uh, ever since. No stop. I mean, the well was continuous. It's an uncommissioned, continuous paper. A few years back, like 2018, I, I presented that one. Uh, uh, I mean, that was part of a paper on unconventional uh, well testing and tight formations. And it was uh, well received and uh, was accepted, uh, contacted us to, to, to put it on journal. So it went to the journal, uh, that, that paper. It's a very, very good uh, area. I had cases from different parts of the world. And, from US, um, from Algeria, from Saudi also there. And uh, so while on formation testing, I said, let, let's put this one here also. Over 95% of the, of the DSTs are operated in case hole. I mean, they can do it in open hole, but nowadays they do it in case hole conditions, but while on formation tests are uh, done in open hole. One of formation tests is like a pad that you can put against the formation and then there is a, a jack or hydraulic stuff on the back, back behind it that is pushing it against the formation. This is one technique. Another technique which that you can separate the, the section of the reservoir pads. So there's a pad here, there's a pad there. Those are mainly done for uh, lower primitive formations, done for when I want to do a fracturing. I can, we can do fracturing with wireless. I can put pads and inject into that, and then we call it a macrofrag. I can create a macrofrag and then get the uh, profits. I'm not going to go through those because that is going to deviate too much from here. But anyhow, so it's pad, and once I put the pad like a eight inch, eight to nine inches height, that is the area that I'm, I'm analyzing. One feet away, two feet away, there could be some layers here that are isolating it. So that, that zone could have different properties than this zone. So it is important once you do a wall formation test for analysis, for, for formation analysis, I need to know uh, what is going on. I need to have some image log. The image log is gonna help us whether it is really draining this much or a lot more. Some cases we have seen that it drains like 10, 20, 30, 50 feet with the wall formation. Some cases it is only draining like few feet. So this is very important to, to get that one. And then, so now, uh, nowadays we say uh, for any of these uh, uh, new, new wells, um, places that you're not too much familiar with it, use wall formation tester. And then you use uh, the, the DST uh, for the infield drilling, or once you're done that one, you wanna do a further study and so people, companies, they are um, moving away from DST for, because it's expensive and it has some limitations. Because with water formation test, you can get a, a sample of the fluid, download conditions, and pressurize it, bring it to surface. In DST, you can do that, but the, some of these DST, like the one that I showed, like the fastest DST, it, it's a special tool for that one. 
And, but now in one run, we can go and test several layers. So it's not only here because it could be like that. I go up there, I go up there. So make several of these tests and then I can get a pressure profile history. I can plot these pressure profiles and then connect them and that will give me the, the gradient of the fluid which is, there, which is very accurate. Yeah. So let me show you a case of a, in Brazil, is a typical DSC with uh, supplemental well logs and core analysis. I'm basically, I'm not showing the logs because it takes a lot of time. This is called, what we call is a pre-salt uh, lacustrine carbonate formation in the SAG reservoir, which is salt aptian age. So for those of you guys who are geologists, I'm not a geologist. I know a little bit to, to get by. It's a campus basin in Brazil. So I did, I uh, hide a lot of the information, but it was a very important, interesting to show this one here. This is, if you look at the scale here, this is in centimeter from zero to 85, okay? Uh, centimeter, this is a core, huh? A core that they, the, the core is like a, a four inch core. Now they look at this part, the top part of it, and they, they did a core two six inch long, in this four inch diameter core. And then these are the, uh, from zero to 15, which is up here, zero to 15 in this area. The second one was from, from 48 to 63, which is from this area. Hmm? And prosthesis is 11.4 versus 9%. Primarity is about 70 million dollar C versus 79, which so far is okay. But look at the KVKH, which is the vertical over horizontal parameter, which is what which we call it anisotropy. Anisotropy in this one is like 0.096, almost like 0.1. This is almost like 0.4. So this has uh, <clears throat> this has a lot of uh, high vertical communication, but this part there is no vertical communication. Then they did a one and a half inch diameter by 3.25 inch long core, core plug from this area, which is the, from the same uh, four, four inch uh, core, <clears throat> but it's only one and a half inch diameter. Now the parameter is a lot higher, it's almost 200, crosses 8%. And then they did this section here, they did a one inch diameter by two inch uh, core plug. And so now this is, uh, uh, from the sidewall core, Rory sidewall core. And uh, that one gives a process of 2.6 and permeability 1.9. You can see so much, look at permeability on, the, on that area, on the top is uh, 70, here is 70. This one is uh, 200. And then this one in the same area is 1.9. So that shows that there's a lot of anisotropy. They have so many different techniques. The, the, Petrophysicists, they do that one. So they have one of them is called Lorenz analysis, which is you you plug the, the good pay zones versus productivity stuff like that, and then they came up that they it is only needed to uh, fifty percent of the gross pay needs to be perforated, and that's what they did. So they didn't talk to reservoir engineers. <laughs> so they perforated fifty six percent of this well. And then this is the DSC that they did. So this is very similar to the previous one. You go there, you go down hole, and then pressure increases. And then these are some free stuff, setting packers. Now from here, you started uh, opening up to, to basically clean the formation. They opened up here, they opened up more here. <clears throat> Even they, pro they dropped the pressure to about 3,000 <clears throat> from, from almost 70, 7,500 here. And uh, they did a buildup. I mean, when I look at this buildup, which is sharply goes up, sharply flat, that shows a lot of skin. When you have a lot of skin damage, pressure builds up straight like that one and like that one, and also high permeability. So now uh, they decided to do some acid job. So they did a massive uh, acid uh, ball heading, which is you push it at a high pressure. So they went to uh, reservoir pressure is about 6,800 or so. They went to about 11,000 PSI when they were injecting. And so not only they did acidizing, but they also fractured. That's what I believe uh, from, the, from the data. And then after that, they did a, a post flow, one flow buildup and a second flow buildup. And the second flow, they draw it a little bit lower. And then you can see 
it is more like a normal situation. And let's look at some other plots. These are the two plots. This is the pressure buildup of the same sequence. So this is the pressure buildup here. So one of them is here, the second one is here. So the first one, the first one is the blue one. You can see that there's a pressure, this is wet bore storage, and then drops sharply. That shows there's a very high skin damage. And then after that is declining almost like a minus uh, three quarter. That, that is uh, minus one half, sorry, minus one half, which is indication of partial penetration. So that shows me, that's that uh, core plug that I show you from that uh, 80 inch interval, there's a low communication vertically. But when they did the acid, uh, that acid job at the very high bed, they, they cleaned up, they fractured it. Basically, the, no, the fracture connects the entire zone. So now that the entire zone is connected, you can see the purple color is a pressure. The top one is pressure, the lower one is derivative. Anytime the, the shape is like that, that is an indication of a very low skin or a hydraulic fracture. So it's totally different. Okay, this is totally different. And so the ball of acidizing was very successful. Now, this is another situation from Angola. This is a, uh, one of the wells called Orca 1 for Angola. And then this is the, the sequence of several flows and buildup. You cannot see because the scale is very high. And then they, they did the same thing. They did the bullhead acidizing here, very similar to the previous one. They did bullhead acidizing here. And then there's a flow period 2 and the buildup 2, flow period 3, buildup 3. And because now we are showing the entire thing, but if you zoom on any section, you can see, and then the, on the bottom is the floor, right? Huh? If you zoom on this one here, you can see this around 120, 125, which is this, area. you see this area? <clears throat> this is this area. And then this one is around 190 here, the 190 is here, okay? So this is the, the flow and build up. Again, if you plot the, the, the on this, uh, this is called Cartesian plot. This is called the log log plot. On the log log plot is that I call it. We call it diagnostic plot because the early part is well bore storage <clears throat> and then drops down and goes to radial flow. So it is radial flow here. And then these are some of the parameters that we are able to find. Parameter is 116. Reservoir pressure is there, and skin is minus 3.4. So this is after they did the ball heading. Another thing that uh, is part of the well testing is the gradient surveys. Anytime, anytime that I recommend to do a well testing, I design the well testing, and then at the end I tell them, when you're coming up from the well bore, because now everything is, uh, is uh, stationary condition, when you're coming up the well bore, you make some stops. So if this is the pay zone, your, your tool is here, or your gauge is here. Go like 50 feet higher, and then stop for five minutes, four minutes, whatever, because I can see that there's a, the time is constant, and then at that support. And then go a little bit higher, 100 feet, and then stop. Go up there, 500 feet, 200, whatever. I mean, depend on the patients. The more, the better. So every two, 300, you go there, make it two minutes, three minutes, whatever, stops. Whatever you can get out of them. Five minutes is better, but I mean, sometimes you can, I can set it up with two, three minutes, because pressure is going up and then here up and then here that's how the performs and then you can read it from the from the job log you can find out at what depth they up and then now you have the pressure from the data so now if you plot these pressures versus depth tvd not not measure them you find out the 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 properties of that fluid which is in the well bore so uh, there's a lot of wells, I mean, and these wells, uh, I mean, at one time we had 1.1 1, 1 .1 million wells just in North America, that these wells require bottom pressure surveys for so many reasons. And find uh, one of them is uh, find that the average of pressure for mapping reservoir. What I'm saying, okay, now that you're doing that one, just make the stops, let me find out that what fluid you have, because now this is additional information. And then they want to establish uh, the depletion and set up uh, production allocation. They do that a lot. I mean. There are some wells that uh, they exceed their allocation. You can see the are pumping wells. You can see that the, this well is uh, shut in for a month, and then another offset wells producing, and so on, because the government puts some kind of uh, um, allocation on how much they can produce. 
So it's a good idea to do PFS. These are some um, stuff that they use in uh, Algeria. Pressure, the phone, the static, or something like that. That's a static pressure. And then they, they also have the, the dynamic pressure that I'm going to show it to you. And then we can use these to get us all gravity, uh, to, to know that how is the pressure drop in the wetboard. Now, if I knew that one, when you do nodal analysis uh, to, to basically fine tune your wellbore, we call it VLP, vertical lift performance, you need to have uh, the pressure drop because the pressure drop dynamic is a function of the fluid that you have over there with these points plus the friction pressure in the, in the tubulars. So those, uh, you need to do that. So you run the gauges on wireline. So some of the typical gradients that you see, if it is a gas well, uh, you see pain between 0.001 to 0.2. So this is PSI per foot. Why arrange? Because a well has different pressure. So in a well bore, I could have 6,000 PSI pressure. In another well, I could have only 500 PSI pressure. So this could be the 500 PSI, this could be a 6,000 PSI pressure because it's compressed. Gas, gas can be compressed and then expand compression, all right? So that gives me a fluid density in pump per cubic foot that's in 0.14 to 229. If I have a gas condensate, the liquid part is gonna have like 0.2 to 0.25 is heavier, and the density is 29 to 36. And this is the specific gravity. Oil is between 0.25 to 0.413, with a density of 36 to 59 and a half. And specific gravity is going to be 0.58 uh, to 0.9. Specific gravity is, means the gravity divided by that of water. Huh? That's called the specific gravity. And then water is between 0.4 to 0.495. A fresh water at surface is 0.433. So this is between these two numbers. And then the fluid density is, the, that's a range for the fluid density, 57.4 to 71. So the fresh water density is 62.4. That's what we use. And uh, this is the, the specific gravity. Now we have two equations here, which you can derive one from the other. One is the API. Uh, and actually I think one of the, the tests that uh, you're gonna see at the end it relates to this one, API. And the other one is about uh, supercharge. So in what formation supercharge will happen, which we discussed. Discuss the API is 141.5 divided by specific gravity minus uh, 131.5. And then if you solve for gamma, which is basic gravity, is this equation up here. So um, just look at this one. Specific gravity of water, fresh water is one, huh? So if I put one here, then it is 141.5 minus 131.5. So the epic gravity of water is 10. This is the time that I'd like to be in a live audience, ask question from them, but you know, a lot of people uh, are participating, so. But then, anyway, so epi gravity of water is one, uh, is 10, sorry, it's 10 because 141.5 minus 131 and half is one. And then if you put 10 here for epi gravity, then 131 and half plus 10 is 141.5, so a specific gravity is one. So you can get one from the other one. And the other thing that you need, need to remember, the API gravity is what is at surface, at surface condition. So you cannot get the density of a fluid in the reservoir because now it's different conditions. It has gas in it, or for the oil has gas in it, and under pressure, so it has to be surfaced. So I have done a lot of this kind of charts, especially for for shell in Gulf of Mexico. I did a lot of uh, production logging and testing, the multi-layer testing those. So this one is the gas here. It has a gradient. Remember, I told you every 100 feet, 200, 300, whatever, you come up, you stop, and then you read pressure. So this is, uh, so you start from here at 20,000 feet, that's pressure is 9,000, and then you come down here at, uh, for instance, uh, 18,000, pressure is 8,000, and so on and so forth. Huh? And, then, and then once you pass this one, the pressure is not gonna drop as fast here, which is here. So now you're in the oil zone here. If you draw a line, a straight line, Believe me, this is a design, but I'm sure you should, it happens. It shows such a nice straight line. So this one gives you a, a, a basically a slope of this one, which we call a gas, is 0.032. 
and then for the oil is 0.315 and for the water is 0.449. So right now, based on this is slow button is gas, oil and water. This is one thing. The, the other thing is the intercept. The intercept between gas and oil is 4,000. That's the oil, the oil gas contact in the well bore. And then 9,000 here is the oil water contact in the well bore. Again, density. Huh? Density is a function of pressure and condition. So this is a well that you're producing it. Pressure is dropping up to here. The density at this point was 0.375, or the gradient was 0.375 PS by per foot. You do a buildup. It is 0.415. So this is based on the fluid that exists at that time and also pressure. The higher pressure is going to compress the fluid more. Right. These are, uh, I think, some cases from Algeria uh, that the wellhead pressure was 209. The same thing, you're coming up, then you're getting the gradient. And then the fluid gradient was 0 0.0253, which is 0 0.1096 psi per foot. And then this is the data at the different depths. This is the time, and this is the pressure. You just plot it. You can plot it on Excel, I mean, whatever. I mean, this one probably was done on Sapphire. This is the, this is dynamic, and this is the static gradient, okay? The static gradient on the same well and was done, let's compare the two. For the static gradient, uh, the density is 0.12, pressure well height is 241, the dynamic is less fluid gradient and lower, I mean, which is very obvious. Huh? When you're flowing it, you're losing pressure, so well head pressure is going to be lower. When you're flowing it, lower pressure is not going to be as dense as when it is static under higher pressure. All right? So you can draw a lot of this conclusion to find out what is the fluid type over there. And so here is... Um, so again, when you go to this one, 0.12, when you go to the scale that we put over there, 0.12 is somewhere here. Huh? And I believe that it could be even oil because the, the oil in Niger is very, very light. I am not exactly sure, but most probably this is oil. Okay, I have drawn some cartoons here. When I have a gauge here, uh, put it with a wire line somewhere here, uh, that pressure is gonna read the pressure above it. So it's gonna be hydrostatic head above it, like a gamma H. H is this one, gamma is a density. If I know pressure, if I know H, then I can get gamma, all right? But this is if I have a single fluid here. How about if I have more than a single fluid here? If I have two gauges at a certain distance from each other, connected to a wire line, I send it down, down the, the hole, and now I read this pressure, I read that pressure, the, the, the difference between these two is delta P, and then the H between the two is known, let's say they are two feet apart, okay? So I know within that two feet or one feet, whatever, apart, that's the pressure difference. I can divide it and find the density within those. So now this would be the entire pay. One of the quiz questions comes from here, all right? That I give you the, some of these uh, contacts. And then I want you to find out at a certain depth what is the pressure. So now I can wait. So now let's go a little bit further. If I can move this one uh, here to the bottom, then I know what is the fluid here. If I move it up here, then I know what is the fluid here. If I move it all the way, if it is not changing, that means the same fluid, okay? The, the, the delta P between the two. Once I get here, if the delta P is basically increasing now, then I know that I got into the lighter fluid, all right? And once I move up there and then it decreases, and then after that doesn't increase, that means I'm, I'm in that lighter fluid, all right? Very simple, very simple, but very, very inform informative. So the, the equation is like pressure is the specific gravity times H. When you have two of them, the pressure difference between the two gauges is the specific gravity times H of the two. Very simple, very effective. Now, this is again one of the cases in the offshore Gulf of Mexico that I did for Shell. 
And the reason I, I mentioned this because I have published a lot of these things. So th these are in different papers. This, this, one, this one also went to the journal. What are the production logging and multi-layer testing? So we had two gauges. One was uh, the permanent downhole gauge that Shell puts over there, all right? Now we have a Halliburton goes with the production logging. So depending on where it is, the distance between the two, huh, I can find some of these uh, delta P's. That's the one of them. And then uh, we had a place that we, anytime I do the production logging, I come here and park at different floorage. So now I know the difference between here. I go and increase floor rate, go up and down and come and park here. And then this is, this one is the shell gauge, all right? So now when, when, when the, the well is not flowing, you can see here, uh, this is flowing and the x-axis is flowing. So when the well is not flowing it, the delta P is 71.3. So when I, measured it at uh, like 1500 or so, still the same thing. That means I do not have much friction. I do not have much friction. So there's no friction. And this is hydrostatic. From the delta P between the two, I was able to get the uh, gamma H uh, subtract from each other. It comes to be 0 0.3035. And this was exactly the fluid that the uh, shell had told me that, that, that uh, gravity. I'm going to show you in the next slide. But now that I start going at faster, I go like 2,600 barrel per day production, now it is high. So now you have a friction, friction losses. So no, the friction losses increases. Once I go to, let's say 40, 3,800, friction is more and, and more. So in this case, it's like 85 minus that one. So if this is 71 to 85, it's 14 PSI more pressure drop. So these are the pressure drop which is very, very important when you're doing nodal analysis because you need to characterize your, your, your tubulars. So in this case, the density was, uh, the density that, that Shell had given me was 31 and a half, uh, the API, and when you put it uh, at the downhole condition, and uh, it's gonna be 43.47 pound per cubic feet, the equation that I gave you. <clears throat> which is 0.697 gram per cc or 0.302 PSR. So this is what Shell had given me from that. I, I was able to, to bring it to the downhole condition, get, get the density. So that is 0.302, all right? And at surface condition, the same oil would be a little bit different, would be 0.87 gram per cc, and which is gonna be 0.376, because once the oil comes to the surface, the gas is gone, it's gonna be heavier. Water is different, different than oil. It, water is heavier down hole. Gas is heavier at surface. So based on the gradient uh, from 7,000 to 16,000 TVD, the pressure gradient was, that I was calculated was 0 0.301. So theirs was 0 0.302. And then from 6,000 to the surface, it was like 0.28. So it was lighter fluid. And then, the pressure gradient between the production logging and the, uh, and the permanent downhole gauge after five hours into the builder was 0.303. So during the flow was 0.301, during the builder was 0.303. So it didn't change much. So flow after flow test. A lot of these tests that we did for Shell uh, with production logging is flow after flow test. I mean, same here, when you flow it at different, different flourish here, okay? So there are several flourish that you do. You stabilize one and then you increase and then you stabilize one and you increase. And the same information I can get, PI, I can get productivity index. I can uh, not get the skin if I do not have the skin from previous one. I cannot get permeability, but I assume permeability is the same. So if, I, if you have done another well test before that you have some of these parameters here, this will be very good to, to compare them. This is a um, design that I created. So I, this is the flow rate here at one flow rate and then I build it up, I, I increase it. And then, so these are every two hours, two hours increase it and then two hours increase it and two hours increase it to the max. Huh? So anytime you increase the flow rate, pressure drops. So pressure is here initially drops and then it stabilizes, drops, stabilizes, and so on. If I, if I say at this rate and that pressure, uh, if I pick that, that pressure at this rate and then at that pressure at this rate and this one and that one and plot it. So I've done it for several cases of uh, 
thousand million dollar C and five hundred million dollar C, each one with the skin of zero and the skin of uh, five. So, for instance, here is thousand million dollar C, skin of five. Pressure drops more because you have more damage. You have to produce at the uh, at the basically more pressure drop to to get the same flow rate as this case, which is thousand million dollar C and no skin. All right. So now. If you plot it on the bring into the sapphire program or something like that, and now you get a log log plot of these, you, you have well bore storage in this area. This is log of delta P, log of delta T here, and uh, well bore storage here. And this is uh, the, the brown one is uh, <clears throat> basically 500 million Darcy and uh, skin of five. And then the lowest one is here, which is a purple one here. This is a parameter of 1,000 and the skin of zero, okay? So when you see the two for a parameter of 1,000, the derivative of both of them are, are on top of each other here, regardless of a skin. The skin ha happens here. For the parameter of 500 with the skin of zero and skin of uh, five, they both are going, they're on top of each other. But the 500 is going to stabilize at a higher value than the, the 500, that 1,000, okay? The, the higher that this bump goes here, the hump here goes, that means the higher, uh, it has higher skin and it has lower permeability. The example that I showed you before when they did the uh, basically um, high pressure wellhead uh, acidizing, the, 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 that, that shows like a no, no damage. So it started like here and then just like that one went there, there was no harm. So now if I plot those values of the, the remember, stabilized pressure and the, the rate, stabilized pressure and the rate, you plot them here, you get these points here. So now for all of them have the same pressure. So on the, on the X axis is my flow rate, on the Y axis pressure. If I, if I just draw these numbers here, I mean, if I uh, connect these points here and extrapolate it, and for all of them, they are all going to go to PI because I use the same PI for all of them. So this one is called a productivity index here. The productivity index is here that you uh, get a straight line here. As long as you're above bubble point, as long as you're above bubble point, they extrapolate to PI, but here I'll show you what happens below point. Below bubble point is gonna continue until you hit the bubble point. If the bubble point is here, then you're gonna go curve down. Okay, so now we go to the basic production and Vogel and, and standing type of plot, which is um, not, maybe we talk about it next week. So now it's from the slope of these, you can get productivity index, all right? So, I plotted the data, put it in Excel spreadsheet. Excel spreadsheet give me the slope, the slope and intercept. So these are the slopes. And then if I, I put them here also for the, let's say four different flow rates and the permeability. And the slope is, uh, these are the slopes here, huh? 0 0.01, 0 0.01, stuff like that. So these are the slopes here. You can see that the four slopes. From the slope, if you just reverse them, you divide it by one or, or one, one over the number is gonna be product index. So now you can get the product index from just putting, flowing at uh, three, four different uh, flow rates, stabilize it, plot it there. Slope is, uh, reverse of the slope is product index in stock time bar purpose. A lot of the, the uh, old companies, they rely on this product index because that tells them how well that well is gonna produce. 100 is a good number, 150, something like that. But some wells, after the pressure is depleted and you, you do a test like that one again, <clears throat> it's gonna be like one. So you know that well is, doesn't have much more life. And then here I'm putting for you an equation which is called the radial flow uh, Darcy equation, all right? Q in the stock time barrel per day is gonna be this number, 7.08 times 10 to the power minus three, KH per minute times H, We'll make this combination called formation capacity multiplied by initial pressure minus P at the well, well bore, mu viscosity B formation volume factor multiplied by natural log of RE, which is the size of the reservoir. So let's say it's 1,000 feet, so it's 1,000 feet divided by RW. So let's say 0.3 or 0.5 or something like that, plus the skin. So 
So this is a very simple equation that uh, uh, I can use to get the flow rate. If I drop the pressure, result pressure is 6,000, if I drop it to 4,000, how much flow rate am I going to get? Just plug in this equation, get it, all right? You need to know these two, mu and B, from the PVT and then permeability from well test. Now, productivity index is defined as flow rate divided by delta P. Flow rate is here, delta P is here, so you just bring these two to the left, then that's the equation for productivity index. So now you can see that the productivity index is equal to, I have this number from the, this flow after flow. And then if I have mu and B uh, from PPT, okay, and I have RW, which is well bore radius, I have RE, which is size of reservoir. And even if you do not have that, that RE, you can just use a number, huh? You try it yourself. If you put 1,000 or 2,000 because you take a log of that one, it's not going to be make that much difference. You put a number, be your best thing. Then you can get KH. Okay. Now, if you have, if you know K from the previous, remember I said previous test. If you have K from previous test, you can plug it that it can get the skin. Ah, now, now, simple test, which you didn't shut the well in, huh? because a lot of companies, they do not want to shut the welding because sh shutting well is you lose money. You're just producing it. You just change the choke size, huh? You are able to get a lot of information from that well. And as you can see here, uh, for instance, uh, the, the, the green is 1,000 milliDRC skin of zero. The red is 1,000 milliDRC and the skin of five. And you can see the product things is different. So if you plug it in, you can find the skin. All right. So the flow after flow objectives very similar to those. I already talked about those and uh, these equations. And then P, this flow efficiency is uh, if I have productive index now divided by productive index that was done at when you the first DST, the first test that you didn't well, and then you can get the flow efficiency. I mean, you hope to get flow options close to one, but it's not the case. And then uh, you, you can get additional skin, uh, just plug it into two different scenarios. You had the skin here, and then at the later you have a skin. You can just plug into this uh, equation and find out uh, what would be the additional skin. So I guess you said that you're gonna keep the equations at the end. I'm going to have one, one more section here, and then after that, I'm going to make a quick five minutes, ten minutes uh, run of the software. And, okay, we are, we are good on time. So this one is a fluid flow in cores, uh, which is the Darcy law. Okay, Darcy law. Darcy law says that if you have a core, and then this one was done in 1856. These are the experiments done in 1856 by Mr. Darcy. And so... He's pumping uh, fluid from this end, goes through the core, and then comes out of here at this end. So pressure is higher at P1 and P2. So hopefully you have the same flow rate. If you set up your, your equipment correctly, you have the same flow rate here. And then this is the length of that. So this is the equation that he came up with. He tried different things, the increased pressures, and then what kind of linearity he find. He find if have the permeability is higher, flow is gonna be higher. Cross sectional area is higher, he can, pass more fluid through that one. Viscosity lower, so if he does it with water, and then, or with the viscous fluid, is gonna uh, relate that one to flow rate. And then, if, if I put more pressure here, higher delta P, more flow rate. If the length is shorter, it's gonna be more flow rate. So he came up with this equation. So now this is called, I, this shape of it is called Darcy unit. And then I put the, the, the units here, CC second, and uh, CC second for gas, pressure atmospheric, length is centimeter, and permitting in Darcy unit, and then area centimeter squared, centipoise for viscosity, temperature is degree Kelvin, not degree C. Time is in hour. If you just change the units to field unit, because we like to make everything to field unit, and uh, then this is the equation. There's a, just a multiplier here. And so now rate is gonna be in barrel per day. For the gas is gonna be 
MCF per day for precious PSI for length is going to be foot milli Darcy now, which is uh, 1000 uh, milli Darcy is going to be one Darcy. Area is going to be foot square, semi poise for that one. Temperature is going to be degree R. And now time is in second here. So you can see sometimes this equation, sometimes you can see this. So instead of that, it could be one, oops, one over 887. All right, so, so there's different versions of it. This is linear flow. Now, if you have radial flow, so the fluids are moving from different radially towards the well bore, and there's some integration, then you can come up with this equation. This is the equation that we already talked about it earlier, huh? Very simple. It is 7.8 times 7 times minus 3, kh delta p divided by mu b ln of audio over w, okay? This is in field unit. This is in uh, Darcy unit. If you have a skin, then you add the skin to that. So the, the fluid type that we have are either steady state, semi-steady state, or pseudo steady state, that's when the boundaries are seen, or transient. Transient is when it is changing before you get to the steady state or that one. There are some equations, so for the steady state, you can just use Darcy equation, which we already showed it. So this is the third time we're showing that equation because this <laughs> equation is simple, but very important. Very, you can do a lot with this equation. So if you uh, make it linear, if you just solve this one, and then you can solve for pressure. So this is the pressure part, and then the skin part is gonna come here. So skin effect, I think one of the questions is gonna relate to this one, delta B of the skin. So delta B of the skin is this equation, Q mu B over K times skin. And then, um, I can, again, solve this equation or combine this to come up with this equation, which is the same as that one. So all of these three are the same equation. Now, there is another derivation, which I'm not gonna go through. The derivation is solving for P bar. This is on pseudo states when pressure is dropping and then pressure is not PI anymore. It uses the same shape of equation, but PE at the boundary is gonna be P bar, average of pressure. The same equation, the only difference is one half here. And this is for steady state flow. Again, steady state flow is a type of flow that uh, at any point reservoir in the reservoir pressure is not changing. That's a steady state. You, you do not have any depletion. That's like a gigantic uh, reservoirs in Saudi or um, in Guar field or in um, in uh, Kuwait because Kuwait has a lot uh, under uh, pressure under uh, water drive because it's close to the Gulf and then the water is, is going to drive it and maintain reservoir pressure. Some of these wells are producing for 50 years and with minimal pressure drop. I mean, sometimes you have pressure drop, but when once you shut the well in, the pressure goes up again, right? So uh, I forgot to say the, so if it is a steady state, once you shut it in, pressure is gonna build up to the same PI. So this P bar is like a um, arithmetic average when it is flowing. So now if you look at this one here, this is distance and pressure. Pressure is gonna be constant for this is the uh, 100 mil RC. There's a little bit pressure drop. This one is gonna pressure drop more. This is like a, one milli RC, so pressure drops more. Now this one is 0.2 milli RC, so you can see pressure drops a lot more. So this is the pressure profile in the reservoir for different permeability. And then this is bubble pole line. Again, this is another game. So compressive is very important also. Uh, that is how the well depletes. If it's gonna deplete fast, you lose pressure fast or low, that all depends on how compressive, because as you produce fluid out, the rock is gonna expand and fill up that area, preventing pressure to drop significantly. So it's very important, CT is very important. CT's total compressibility is COSO, CWSW, plus CGSG plus compressibility of the rock, okay? So the definition of compressibility is one over volume DVDP, which means if I have a certain volume, and I increase pressure by let's say one PSI, how much volume is gonna change? Okay, so that is give me C. 
So there are some versions of that one, and then this is another version of that one that you can get volume uh, compressibility. Okay. The same thing is with density because mass stays constant, so volume and density change. The same equation applies here, and then you can get this equation based on density. Okay. Now you can play with this equation. So that's a basic equation. Now you can say, okay, if I'm in the reservoir, volume is going to be volume of the reservoir. Pi R E squared R is the reservoir drainage area times H porosity. You can also say, okay, if I'm dealing with oil, then the same thing, but I can multiply by one minus SW, water saturation, to give me the, the hydrocarbon volume. So all of these are the same versions of that one. So this is, I like this equation a lot, and I think a couple of questions are related to this equation here in the field unit. So NP, which is the oil produced, multiplied by BO, this is from the same equation because uh, not uh, stock time barrel at surface, BO uh, takes it to the volume inside the reservoir, which is that NP, all right? QW, the, the fluid BO times time divided by 24 hours, so it makes it day because Q is in barrel per day, I need to divide the time because the time is in hours divided by that one. And then uh, is equal to this equation. C, CT, it's not CO or C of the rock anymore, CT, the total compressibility, times area, H net, net productive interval, porosity, one minus SW, and then pressure is gonna be this one, divided by 5.615 to change it from cubic feet to barrel. So here is barrel to the right, barrel to the right, okay? This is in the RC. Mm -hmm. So you can play a lot of uh, different questions from here. If I have reserve pressure 6,000, uh, pressure after a while drops to 5,000. So this is 1,000. I know saturation is 20% water. I know porosity is 15%, 0.15. Net pay is 50 feet. Area is from here. CT is, let's say, 15. How much oil am I producing? So just from production here, how much I produce, I can get the, how much I, I mean, from how much pressure drop, I can find out how much you produce, or vice versa. If I have, if I, I'm keeping tap of, which all the companies are doing that, they, they have production, they know how much oil they have produced, they have the reservoir type, then they know what is the reservoir pressure now, average reservoir pressure now. Okay, so if it is a big reservoir, pressure is going to drop a little bit. If it's a small reservoir, pressure is going to drop. So one of the questions is about this equation, All right? And these are some of the definitions that we use, like uh, KH formation capacity, lambda is K over mu, which is mobility, uh, higher K, higher mobility, lower mu, higher mobility. KH over mu is called uh, transmissibility. And then VHCT, which is a function of how much uh, I am stored fluid in that area called storativity. Eta is uh, K over mu CT is a uh, function of uh, how easy it can flow. It's called diffusivity. And so the uh, movement of pressure in the reservoir um, is a, like a diffusion and pressure moves in the formation at the rate which is proportional to this diffusivity. And then there are some dimensions, parameters, which I'm not gonna go too much over then. You can look at it because this presentation is gonna be recorded and would be available. We have dimensions time, based on time, hour, based on area, based on pressure, dimensionless radius, dimensionless well water storage, stuff like that. And uh, then, um, we have the semi-steady state flow uh, for radio flow that uh, uh, basically uh, it goes, remember the pseudo says when the boundary comes here, it happens when the TDA is higher than 0.25 pi. Some places the quality is just 0.1, as simple, because it's not exactly that, but simple uh, dimensions time of uh, based on air, TDA. More than 0.1 is uh, pseudo steady state, all right? So at the pseudo steady state is a pressure, slope of pressure where time is constant. That means pressure is dropping with fluid at the constant rate, right? So I'm gonna show you here, this is called the MBH plot. This is uh, all the techniques. And then uh, this is that point one. See that X axis, this is dimensionless time based on area, point one. Before that is uh, transient. 
But after that, it is mo moving on a, almost like a straight line. That the straight line is called the semi steady state or pseudo steady state, right? Now, this is for cases that the, this is the reservoir and the well is at the center of the reservoir, like a circle, like a square, almost like a rectangle, rhombus, or even triangle at the middle. Right? If it is not at the middle, it is going to be different. So, if it is middle, it's going to be here at point one. If it is a square, but the, this is the well at the upper side, it's going to be at the later time and corner later time. The more odd the location of the well with respect to the reservoir, it is too close to the boundary, then it is the pseudo state is going to start at the later time. So, again, I'm, I'm, um, there's a lot of uh, techniques that uh, we are not covering that are related to. So, so these are some of the equations for pseudo steady state that uh, we use, but uh, eventually it comes up to an equation like uh, this one, which is the same as before, but for p bar, remember that was minus one half, now it is minus three quarter. Okay. And uh, so you can play with these numbers again. These are just different mani manipulation of that one. So now if you combine all of these together for the pseudo state, they stay <clears throat> in the field unit and then Darcy unit. So this is the, for the field unit PE, which is pressure at the boundary and then PWF. We, then you saw for Q, very similar to the same before, but there's a one extra one half here before it was nothing here. If you go by P bar for the steady state, it was a minus one half, now it's minus two quarter. Okay, a very similar uh, behavior. So now you can go to IPR curve. I think we already talked about here. If this is fluid and then the stabilized uh, pressure, you plot it there. Then you extrapolate, you get to PI here. From the slope of this one, you can get the productivity index and so on. Once it goes below two point, below uh, bubble point, then it is going to curve down. It's not going to continue on the same line here. The red one is a steady set. Steady set means that it doesn't change. So if I increase flow rate to here, this is going to be pressure. But if I uh, lower the flow rate, it goes here. But when pseudo it starts like here, okay, if you go to lower, to higher and higher flow rate, pressure drops more and more. If I want to go back there, it doesn't go back because you depleted the reservoir, pseudo state, all right? You are seeing the boundary. So T1 is here at the later time, it's going to drop here to, to, to T2, okay? So if I, go, if I go like this one here, come here, when I come back, it's going to come back to this line, all right? And so the upper part is very simple, the product in X equation above bubble point. But once it goes below bubble point, then you, you can use there are some uh, generous uh, um, correlation, like Vogel correlation, which is this one, Q over Q max, which is this is Q max and Q max. The Q max, we call it AOF, absolute open flow potential. And to the left is equal to one minus 0.2 pressure minus P average, minus 0.8 pressure minus P average squared. Simple, we can get a lot of information out of that. Okay. Now the radio flow equation for gas. So, so far we're talking about liquid. So gas is, uh, if you, uh, once you go to the integral, viscosity and formation volume factor for gas are a function of pressure. So they're not constant for all we take it constant. So now you, and viscosity, all those things. So they need to come part of the integral and then you, you take the integration, you come up with this equation. Very similar to those, but pressure is P squared. And then the number here changes. Q is a, in MS uh, thousand standard cubic per day. And this is the rest of you. So for gas, if I plot uh, Q on a log scale and versus P squared minus P on a log. So on a log log scale, basically look at this equation. This one on the left-hand side, Q on the right hand side, look at the rest of it. These are constant, all right? So if I plot it, it's gonna be a constant line. And then if I go to the maximum pressure, which is maximum rate, which is gonna be where pressure is zero. If this guy is zero, PWF here is zero, then I get the maximum pressure, which is PI squared. So I can extrapolate there, get my AOF, and then from the slope of this line, I can get the, my permeability and the rest of the stuff in the get. 
transient model is um, basically a lot of history. This is uh, what the really it is happening in the reservoir. This is the way we assume it. I'm just going a little bit uh, faster. We do conservation of mass, fluid flow, equation of a state, combine them together, come up with this partial uh, differential equation, which is now for the transient equation, right? And now for the transient, things change here. This is the, the reservoir or this is pressure here, and which is changing over time. And there's a lot of assumptions like a radial flow, homogeneous, stuff like that, negligible gravity, stuff like that, and then come here. And so we have some uh, equations. The, the first equation that came was Van Everdingen and Hurst. They did it on water uh, reservoirs, uh, hydrology. And then they came up with this equation for TDA greater than 0.25 that. And this is the equation that they came up with. It's a little bit uh, complicated. The uh, long one has a lot of basal stuff. And um, so it, when time is large, when time is large, like point, remember this one, like point 0.1 TDA higher than point 0.1, which is when you go to pseudo, so they say, all of this basal area is going to be zero. And then look at the equation. The equation is like the pseudo said this equation that we had, minus three quarter, right? Now, if you solve the equation for um, line source or some other, the same partial differential equation, you come up with this equation, which is more common. Pressure at any radius and time is called the PI plus uh, the constants here, Q mu over KH, exponential integral of the numbers here. And then the exponential integral is defined here. Uh, there are some software for that one. I believe uh, Excel has one exponential integral also. If you solve that one, uh, you can easily get it. I'm gonna show you a plot of that uh, exponential chart that you can get it from there. And there are some exceptions that the rule that the, if time TDW should be more than 100, uh, TDA should be less than 0.1. Because once it is more than 0.1, it's pseudo steady. Huh? So we want to be within the transient part. Remember from the MBH plot, it would be the early part. And then you get to 0.1, then after that, it's pseudo steady state. So we can uh, find out that, uh, I mean, this is an example that I'm putting here. Uh, let's see. This is the EI equation. So now, if uh, x in the EI of minus is, is less than 0.02, it can be approximate by log, natural log. So if you put that one in some uh, that natural log or even log, you come with this equation. This is uh, the more common equation that you know any of the software. They don't use this one. They use the com the, the Bessel function. But the, still, this is very accurate. I have shown a case that I did with Excel. I have an Excel program that generates this one and compares with the, 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 the full uh, solution. So PW is called the PI minus 162.6 Q mu B over KH. This one is called M Horner slope. I've heard about Horner plus Horner slope. Log of KT or free mu CT, or the minus 3.23 plus uh, 0.87 scheme. So this is the equation that you can calculate based on the Result properties, K, well bore radius, and if you have a skin or no, what would be the PWF for a certain fluorid? A lot of time, you know, the company is asking you, okay, what is the expected fluorid because we want to build a pipeline for this formation that we are finishing drilling. So you can just put some of these approximate numbers and then come up with the pressure and fluorid. This is another example that we use the same technique. Now, this is that EI solution. So. If you have the X here on this scale, you go to the right and then you can read the EI of minus. So just, just like that one. And then from here on, it is gonna be a straight line. And that's why they call it, if it is more than a point 0.1, then it's gonna be, uh, you can approximate with the log. These are some your function tables here. And this is a transient flow equation in the field, the same equation. If you plot it here in an Excel uh, for based on certain parameters, you can actually plot it yourself. You can generate a flow rate and a PWF from this equation. 
No, I didn't go to a lot of superposition stuff like that. But if you do superposition, you can come with uh, this equation, which is uh, so the top one is the same as this one is the flow equation. The bottom is the build up equation, which is PWS during build up is equal to PI minus 162.6. Remember, this is the same as that one. This is horror slope log of kt plus uh, <clears throat> tp plus delta t, which is uh, when you, this is your drawdown and build up. So now this is, so when you look at this one on the log log, and uh, you want to analyze it because you, you got to go to the semi-log plot to, to get that one here. And I think we need to stop here. I show you uh, a software. Very simple, it's gonna take like a few minutes. And then I conclude. Okay, so this is Safar. Safar is a well testing program of uh, Kappa Engineering. And uh, once you open it up, on the top left corner it says new, and click on the new. And I'm making it very simple, but it is more complicated. So where we're at is, let's say it's 0.35. Uh, Hazon thickness, let's call it 40 feet. Let's call it 50 feet easier. Prosity, let's say 0.15. This is the time you start. Standard test or interference. Remember we talked about interference test, you can make it interference. The type of fluid, oil, gas, water, oil, single phase, so I'm just gonna use oil. What are the available rates? Do you have gas rate, water rate? Because you could have more than one fluid available. It, it puts all of them to action and then uh, calculates based on those. And it starts with analysis, uh, a standard or nonlinear, multi-layer, formation tester. You, you can use formation tester here or, or a slug test. So all of these are possible with this guy. I'm going very, very easy, straightforward, radial flow, okay? And so the next screen is the PPT. I can click on this guy, go to the more complicated, put all the parameters for the gas, water, or, or if I have the number just because I want to make it fast, if I have the numbers, I'll, I'll put it here. Formation volume factor, let's say it's 1.2. Viscosity, let's say it's 0.8. And compressibility, let's say it's 15 times 10 to the power 6. And then I create it. So based on those PVT, I can go into the PVT simulation part and I can match the PVT from the reservoir that was provided to me into this one. So now I come up with this screen. Okay, so now that the basic information has been entered, then it says load queue. I go to load queue. And if I have an ASCII file, I can load it ASCII file because there are some cases that they have thousands of flow rate. There are some cases that for every pressure, there's a rate. Every pressure is a rate, like, like formation test. Formation test at downhole condition, every, let's say, half a second or so, they have a pressure, they have a rate. So that's a tedious process because now I need to average all of those and uh, get that one. But anyhow, let me just do a simple case. I can do it from clipboard. I can do it the keyboard here, or I can get the spreadsheet. Okay, so keyboard, that's an easy one. Uh, let's say I say I want to produce at 100 barrel per day, okay, for um, 100 hours. Let's make it a little bit different. 200 barrel per day for 100 hours. Oops, sorry. So if you have made a mistake here, it's gonna tell you because sometimes you might have entered it wrong. And so it says 200 times. So now I intentionally did I want to show you here. Sometimes it gets very complicated because now it says 200 decimal times. So the first one is taking time and that one. So now it doesn't understand the order is that one. Okay, so it, it, it picked it about 200 uh, hours for 100 barrel per day. So that's not what I want, so I go back, okay? So I wanna say that 
for 100 hours, I want to produce at 200 barrels per day. Then for another 150 hours, I want to produce at zero. So the first one is a drawdown, the second was a buildup. So now if you have a very complicated situation, there's a, you pick up fields, you pick up columns, and then because as I told you, I could have a million data points. Columns, and then you can go point by point, or you can go the step duration. So some of these, you gotta make sure that the gauge range and the reference for the software is the same. So it gets a little bit complicated, but this is simple. So it generates this for you. So we generate the fluid, which is the liquid right here. And then this is time. So 100 hours and I have 200 barrel per day. And then I have another 150 hours, total of 250, zero barrel per day. All right, so I did that part. All right. Now I need to, because I'm doing a design, I need to generate, generate pressure. So how do I generate pressure? Because now the next thing is load Q, load pressure. I do not have pressure. So when I do this one is when I have actually done a test, I have pressure and rate. If I have that one, then I, and I put it here, but I don't have it. So I'm going to do the design. So I do design, there is a lot of uh, pages here, screens here, this one, that one, and so on. Out, this is output. So I go to more tools, and then under more tools uh, is a test design. I click on the test design. I can pick up the reservoir type. This is the wellbore type, any wellbore type, you know. I can make the well model. I can make it the vertical, horizontal, fracture, all of these, huh? I can make the reservoir homogeneous, heterogeneous, two prosthetic, <laughs> all of these, all right? So, but I'm just doing a simple one, a vertical well in a homogeneous reservoir, okay? And then constant wellbore storage, doesn't have a phase segregation. So now, I come here, C is the wellbore storage. I just put the default skin is zero. And then PI result pressure is 5,000. And uh, uh, KH, let's click on here. Remember H, we made it 50 and K, let's make it what? Uh, mm, another 80. So parameter is 80, okay. So 80 times 50 makes the KH 4,000. So now I have here, now look at here. I can go back here is the fluorid. I can change the fluorid if I want. Gauges, I can make any gauge that I want. Ideal, coarse, whatever, mechanical, string gauge. It has its own fluctuations uh, put into the data. But right now I'm just doing this standard, which is the ideal gauge. There's some settings here that they can put here. You usually don't need to do that. Uh, I, I come here when I'm analyzing the data, but not here. There's a 2D map here, which we are not using that one. There's a schematic of the one shows radio flow, perforation, perforated the entire pay zone. Then I generate, that's it. I, so basically I just needed to put the seek, which is default, the skin, PI and KH, and I can generate. So now this part is a drawdown pressure, pressure is dropping down. This is the, remember I was picking here, the last stables I was picking here with this rate and then plotting it on that uh, IPR curve to get productivity index. And then this is a buildup. It's a very normal, very nice clean uh, buildup. And uh, okay, so now that I generated that one, you can go here and save it. And I can go to the interpretation. Let's say I want to interpret it here. So you can see there's a, I do not have load P, but I can have extract delta P. For, for analysis, I need to have delta P. So the test is build up. I say, okay. And then smoothing um, stuff like that. Then I, so this is the one that we had before. This is called Cartesian plot. This is a semi-log plot, horror plot. This is a log-log plot. A log-log plot is a diagnostic plot. I can look at here, this is, a, this is delta P, this is derivative of the green one. The red is derivative of the green one. This part is well bore storage. Remember, this is the hump, which is indication of permeability and the skin. High skin is gonna be a big hump. Low permeability is a big hump. 
hypermetry is going to be more like flat like that one. And then once the, the derivative gets flat horizontal here, which is roughly about uh, from two hours onward, then it's radial flow. So sometimes you need to design it and find out when you go to radial flow, you design it from here. And tell them, based on the information that you gave me, this well is going to be uh, flat. It's going to go to radial flow after two hours. Usually I double it. I tell them four hours. Because in real life, there's a lot of fluctuations and the data is not clean, so you cannot see this one that clearly. So this one tells me two hours. This is two hours. I tell them four hours. So I double it all the time. Now, let's look at this one. This is a Horner plot. Horner plot is very simple. You, you have the straight line, and then you click on this one, which is line regression. You regress from here to, let's say, here. It draws a line, a straight line through the points, and then uh, it gives you the results. Oops, what do you Well, here. Can you guys, I mean, I'm not sure if you guys can see it, but uh, I can, this is big, bigger. So there's a lot of information, but this is a semi lag analysis. This is a Horner plot here, and intercept is 5,000. Intercept is PI. 5,001, so it's a little bit more, eh, slightly more. K is 79 and a half, not exactly 80, 79 and a half. Skin is not zero, it's minus 0.1. So that means the section that I picked up is not exactly a straight line, it's moving a little bit higher, goes a little bit higher. So now I can just play with it and say regress again from the same point, but half, half that amount. So now you look at that, now pressure, the intercept is 5,000, you see that one? It's 5,000 here. So I hit it right on the money. Permit is higher right now, higher than before, 79.8. Skin is getting less. So now if you just do it in the steps and you regress on a small section of that which you know is horizontal, now the intercept is 5,000 here. K is 79.9, which is almost like 80, huh? Skin is minus, minus 0.01, which is almost zero, all right? So this is called the semi-log analysis. And then if I want to go to the log-log analysis, which is this one here, uh, which is regression analysis. And um, I rely on the regression more than the semi-log analysis. So I click on the model here on the left-hand side. And then I pick up the model. So the model is, I pick up the model. I do not know beforehand. But I look at the data, it looks like radial flow. It doesn't give me any indication of a fracture. It doesn't give me any indication of two, two, two prosthesis. All of these, you need to take a, like at least a one week of school to know uh, how they behave, how the different types behave and stuff like that. So this is a very small sample of that. So now I can do a model. Based on that model, I can, I can pick up the vertebral storage, vertical, very homogeneous. So based on those, and let's say... CPI and stuff like that. Let's say I don't, I'm not sure about this because now it knows the answer. Huh? So let me mess it up. Let me screw it up. Instead of 80, I call it 70. Okay. So my initial point uh, instead of 4,000, 5, let's call it 4,700 here. So I'm, I'm messing up the, the, the analysis. Let's see how, how it's going to generate. Okay. So it generates it. Not exactly because it just generated it. It hasn't done anything. This is this is my numbers. Huh? This is my numbers. You can look at here, click here. These are my numbers. So my numbers. Remember, forty-seven hundred and permit is seventy. But we know it's not like that. And what what is the skin? Does it have a skin? Yeah, I didn't put in skin. skin. So the skin is zero. You see, the skin is zero because this it generated what I gave it to you. Now I go and regress. Regress. Regress is improve. I click on the improve. Okay, put it here. I bring it here. So the C is improving and 10 times lower, 10 times higher. Skin is minus 10 to 10. K goes from seven to 10. Sometimes you can limit it because I put 70, but the, you do not want to go to 70, you can put like up to you, 50 to let's say 100. If you want to limit that one, it's going to be faster. Otherwise, it's going to find. 
So improve and okay. Now you need to go to one step more into this one because I impose pressure. You see that I am keeping the pressure 4700. So now I took it out and now okay. So sometimes you do not know what you did because when, when I changed pressure to 4700, it kept it at 4700. So it was trying to get the best match based on 4700. But now that I uh, unclick that one and let's see what it got. This is the results. Ah, it calculated 5,000, exactly 5,000. It calculated 80. Remember for the Horner plot, the best I got was just pick up a tiny piece of that and I kept out 79.0, but the regression can get it easily fast, all right? Well, that concludes uh, my presentation, like a well, two-hour presentation. All right. I do not know what's next. If uh, questions or yes. what, whatever. Yes. yes, Dr. May, thank you so much for the great presentation. Um, we have received close to three hundred questions, actually. <laughs> So okay, we want get, to get myself time. some lunch. <laughs> yeah, we want to have and time dinner. to answer <laughs> these questions. So I'm just gonna ask like a couple of questions, and then I'll I'll send you um, the rest of the questions so you can answer them in a video or something. It's up to uh, you. I, I mean, I, I joke. I mean, um, I want to keep everybody happy. So yes, ask me sure. questions. <laughs> So the first one, is there any uh, discrepancy found in reservoir properties from conducting DST and other tests such as build up or drawdown? Yes. Not every test. I mean, I just showed it to you. Uh, the, the, uh, one set of data that I just generated designing myself. When I go to the corner plot, I was not able to get 80. So the best that I had to get a small, tiny piece. But in real life, the data is not this smooth. I mean, look at this one. This data is so smooth on a straight line. But it's still, I, when I started from this end to that end, it didn't work. I mean, I mean, it worked for, for, for most practical cases. Uh, customers are going to be very happy if you take it. But I had to get it so close. But in real life, the, the points are not exactly that clean and smooth. Yes, you are going to get the differences between different numbers. Um, when I... Uh, I was in Kuwait in 2015. I came back to the wild information tester. And one of the first things that they asked me is, when we do the formation tester, remember the one that is a pad, the numbers comes uh, higher on permeability than a DST. So I looked at the stuff and, and I find out, I mean, that uh, when they're these young engineers, they're, they're picking up the edge they would take the, the edge from the logs, from this zone, from that shell to this shell. So the, they are using like an edge of, uh, uh, let's say, 20 feet. But in reality, it's not 20 feet. It could be like five feet, right? So it's only that. Part. So I was able to, to show them how to find it. You need to look at the image log. You look at, you look at not only the, the resistivity, but also look at the sonic log, look at the density log, look at these fluctuations, all these fluctuations here and there show you there's a barrier, small barrier. I mean, it could be, it could be like a few inches of a barrier. It could be like a six inch, five inches of a barrier, but it's a barrier because you're putting your tool against the wall, against the wall. So it only sees here. If there's a barrier here, barrier there, no. So uh, yes, because we're doing pinpoint, uh, uh, analysis versus DSD is an average. The, the one I showed you here from Brazil, the Lawrence uh, method, they only performed like 64% of the pay zone. They thought that that's good enough, 64% is going to drain it. But we found that they didn't drain it. And so the numbers will be different. Okay, next question. Okay, so uh, this will be the last question. Uh, which will test tool allows an optimal characterization and triple porosity formation. Optimal characterization of what? Uh, and triple porosity formation. Or oh, triple porosity formation. Ah. Yeah. Yes, we have a model. Uh, Safar has a model. 
it's not on the standard model, it's an external model, but you can get it. I mean, software developed so many from, yes, they have triple permeability, triple porosity. Yes, you can, you can get all of those analyzing. Great, perfect. Uh, everyone no, no, is asking no. for more. Uh, so. uh, yeah, go ahead and ask me some good questions. <laughs> yeah, uh, actually, we, we need to close the session right now, oh, but uh, I know it's late. <laughs> Med is coming back in the, the upcoming week, so check the schedule on the Facebook uh, group. Thank you so much, Dr. Mehdi. Uh, thank you all. We will be sending, sending him the question and have a good evening or a good day, wherever you are. Thank you again, Dr. Mehdi. Thank you very much. I mean, if they ask me on a, like a shared place that they can respond to, that everybody can see it, that would be good. Yeah, we will send you the question and we might arrange for uh, a Q&A session, just a Q&A. Sure. Sounds, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And then if you have any questions, contact me. If you guys need some kind of uh, courses that be taught in your location, just let me know. I mean, I'm, I'm available. I'm retired now. I can, I can do all kinds of things. I can travel. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Dr. <laughs> Mehdi. Looking forward to seeing you and talking to you again. Thank you. Sure. Take care. Thank Bye. you for arranging it. Thanks. Okay.